morning, and welcome to Northminster Presbyterian on this bright, sunshiny, almost fall kind of day. Good day there. We have a few announcements from the pulpit this morning. Uh, first up, next Saturday is the pot is the uh, ice cream social. There's a sign-up sheet in the north next. If you're interested, please do sign up. It's next Saturday at 1 p.m. here on site. Uh, again, sign-up sheet in the north next. And you might know it. Pastor Greg is not here today, so Elder Carl Merrill will be delivering today's uh, message from the pulpit. Are there any other announcements from the floor? Hearing none, let's now prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
praise the Lord from the earth, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all the cedars. come to you in our humbleness, in our sinfulness, and we are grateful that you have taken that and replaced it with your love, your salvation, your forgiveness. Lord, we are not worthy of that, but you did it for us. And we thank you. We 
Thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay. Oh, I just stand right now and repeat after the, what we believe the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God my Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven, and sit upon the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection. 
for our hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Lost. Do not like. 
And so we saw earlier that um, the first three parables uh, were all about finding something. They were the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the prodigal son. Um, this, these next two in this chapter are more a direct response to the hypocrisy that Jesus sees uh, with the Pharisees and, and the attitudes of, of them. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. And the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors, one by one, he asked them first, how much do you owe my master? He answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to them, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 50. Then he asked another, how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended this dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. Now I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, you will entrust to you the true riches. And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all of this, and they were him. So he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts. For what is prized by human beings is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were in effect until John came. Since then the good news of the kingdom of God is proclaimed, and everyone tries to enter it by force. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter in the law to be dropped. This is the word of the Lord. How many of you have ever been saddled by a debt you cannot pay? Often a bank, a hospital, or other loan agent will offer to a person saying, if you pay a certain amount right now, we will forgive the rest of the debt. These institutions know that it's better to get a partial payment instead of writing off the whole amount as a bad debt and thus losing all the money. Now we see with this parable a very complicated story. Our protagonist, the manager, is described as what we would consider today as either a slacker or an embezzler or something worse. The landowner sees that he's doing such a terrible job that he's going to fire him and tells him outright. Now, as manager, he gets the idea well, since I'm going to get fired, what am I going to do? The community hates me. I've taken advantage of everything. What if I change their debt? So he goes and calls the debtors and he changes their debt. And we don't know if, um, and it's not really expressed, whether or not this was the right thing to do 
uh, money wise, if he was actually stealing more money from the landowner, or if he was, um, as I said earlier, uh, allowing for a partial payment for a whole debt. But the landowner comes back and says, you've acted shrewdly in your dishonesty. That's a paradox. How can you act shrewdly and dishonest at the same time? But we see that the manager here was in his own selfishness preparing where he was going to be next. He knew he was going to be fired. He had to go out in the community. They had to accept it. So he changes his reputation with them. Now, when we interpret parables, we often get in trouble where we try to assign different symbolism to different characters and different things. This is not that kind of parable. This is a parable where Jesus is teaching a moral. He says at the end that this dishonest manager, through his actions, was preparing for the future. In other words, he was sitting in his own skin. The landowner acknowledged his selfishness by saying that because he was preparing a new place for himself, he was acting shrewdly. But once again, Jesus is not saying the manager was doing anything right. And in fact, he goes on to equate this manager and uses this term, children of the age. This is a term that is used in scripture to describe people that embrace worldly possessions, lifestyles, attitudes that are contrary to God would want for his people. These people also probably have never heard of God or what he has done for at this point in time for the Jewish population. These are often people that live in the moment uh, some translations will even say these are children of the world. The children of the light that Jesus is referring to are the Jewish people, the Pharisees, and the teachers of the law that he was speaking with and about. So Jesus concludes by saying that selfish rancher was prepared for the future events. But the religious leaders were not be. It draws a distinction that people that depend solely on their wealth and possession will have no place in the kingdom of God, which will be further demonstrated in the next parable that we see. Jesus is still speaking to this primary audience, the Pharisees, calling into the question their hypocritical actions. These leaders, if we look back, they were privileged. They were born into the right family, they were lucky enough to have studied uh, the Torah in its entirety. They argued about different passages. Yet they didn't actually grasp the reasoning of it. And an analyzation of all the laws of Torah, if you get stuck in Leviticus, I can understand. <laughs> means everyone has sinned and means God's atonement. But yet by now these Pharisees, these teachers of the law, they believe because of who they were and what they did, that they were safe. In fact, how dare Jesus, this upstart, says they aren't. And in fact, since with the sinners. Jesus then tells them bluntly, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your heart. For what is prized by human beings is an abomination to the sight of God. Now the irony that cannot be missed in this whole situation is that people under judgment that do not know God are receiving a better treatment. 
And Jesus compares them to having a better tree for them. than the people that should have known by their study that they were living in the appointed time of the Messiah. Now the author Luke will continue to make this contrast that Jesus draws closer to the cross. And pointing out that the Jewish leaders are going to stand condemned not only because they missed this opportunity, but scoffed and mocked at it. Now we're going to fast forward a little bit into the, the what Timothy was dealing with. And it's very interesting that the liturgy actually, this is designed by uh, people um, and committee, and they, they heard this passage, this parable with this passage in Timothy. So we can see what we're preparing for. Now, just a little background in this one. Boy, that uh, Paul was writing this letter to Timothy, who was under house arrest, as I said earlier. During this time, we also wrote Ephesians, Colossians, and Philippians. And there was a point in time that Timothy was even in Rome with Paul. Uh, because Paul even mentions him in all those letters. At some point in time, Timothy decided to is told or um, acts as Paul's emissary to go back to the area of Macedonia and start to work with these churches that are having problems. They're young and all of them do. Um, in the first part of Timothy, we see that he is told to stay pretty much in Ephesus, but we also know he went to other areas. And Paul is describing in Timothy, if we get to look back to that, it, it is the beginning and opening of almost an assurance part. There's, there is right and acceptable before God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus himself, who gave himself a ransom for all that was attested at the right time. Timothy at that point in time was dealing with a much different issue because the area of Macedonia was impact was conquered so many times and this time it was under Roman rule their idea of what a god was or what god was had more of an idea that it was a human with godlike powers and that was the most common belief, and it became a heresy inside the church that later on, uh, that, that was actually still um, working through that. The book of Colossians will deal with that. But Paul takes him and makes it known here that there, there is one way here between God and humankind, Christ Jesus himself, human. He's trying to point out that Jesus is both God and human, just in this small verse. Now what would happen if we had a godly and decent manager acting? We took a look at our sinful condition as a debt. We cannot pay on our own. God the Father is the banker, and we owe that debt. Since we are unable to pay this debt, we had to have a son come and pay it for us. The idea is that this payment was in full, nothing else needs to be paid, and we are free. In verse 6, it says, Who gave himself a ransom for all? 
Now this simple message which Paul was given and what he shared with Timothy and others. This is why Paul was imprisoned, currently under house arrest. We find in the end of the book of Acts that it took many different testimonies in front of many different rulers to get to that point. Now this is the same message that the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, continued to scoff at and mock. If we remember from Paul's history, he was one of them. And he had that blinding light conversion on Damascus Road. Paul is pointing out here the act of salvation is for everyone. God desires no one to perish. This mission is what Paul is working for, and by extension, what Timothy and now us are interested. A very simple, a very complex message at the same time. So what are we going to do with this? Are we going to act like the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, misinterpreting the message, judging others, keeping it to ourselves? Or are we going to be bold and go out into the world proclaiming a saving message to all we see? A message that is counter to what the world is teaching us of wealth, of possessions, lifestyles, and everything around us. But this is a simple, but yet a paradoxically complex message. That Jesus came to save the world. But to do so, he had to die for us. And we have to admit that we need him. Thank you. It's time to look into our hearts and give back a portion of what God has already given us.
were lost, but now we are found. Thanks be to God who searches for the lost. Let us respond to his grace by offering it to others. May the grace, hope, peace, and love of the God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer be with us all. Amen. Amen. Thank you.